Well, hey, I'm Tom. This is Tony. And we are <laughs> uh, going to do this last lesson on becoming a board certified chaplain. Yeah, well, hey, this is our first time doing it like this. So uh, anyway, um, I'm excited to be doing it in this format. And this is uh, going to be fun. So anyway, we're going to do this lesson eight and and go back over and uh, review some things from the prior lessons that we've had. And then, uh, you know, speak a little extemporaneously about different things. But uh, we want to do a good review and then talk about, also in this lesson eight, we also want to talk about things to come and things we're excited about and uh, things that you need to be uh, and have on your radar uh, for the coming weeks. So Absolutely. Anyway. All right. right. Well, shall we begin? We shall begin. All right. All right. So the way we're going to do this uh, lesson is we're going to have a kind of a, a period. We're going to review lessons, lessons one to seven, and we're going to kind of do a question answer and let each other talk uh, and answer um, the big ideas. And then we're going to interject and just make sure that you as a uh, student have received everything that we intended for you to receive. The big ideas, the most important things, we want to emphasize those items. Indeed. Absolutely. So, all right. Well, shall we get started? Sure. Okay. Nope. Sure. So Tom did the first lesson, and it was about the call into ministry, and not just ministry in general, but the ministry of chaplaincy. And the Bible has a lot to say about our call into ministry. And so I'm going to ask Tom uh, just to give us a summary again of what is the uh, right motivation that we should have in our heart and mind as we consider entering a chaplaincy ministry. Well, so without teaching the whole lesson over again, I would just right. say, you know, um, you know, the, our motivation for ministry is the love of Christ, the love of Christ uh, that we experienced from him and that we experience, we on, in an ongoing relationship, we experience from him. And so it's that, uh, that love uh, that we, that we experience. So mo our motivation simply is that love and it's that love relationship with the Lord that, that stirs us, that moves us. And, and so, uh, and so that indicates some other things that needs to be going on. And uh, we'll talk more about those later, but it is the love of Christ that motivates us for ministry. No doubt about it. it and again, it's not, uh, as, as John says, it's not our love for God, but it's his love for us that, that stirs us, that motivates us. And that's so key and important to ministers uh, to have that understanding. And it just speaks to us keeping that relationship. Um, it, it speaks to us keeping that relationship fresh. So. I think it's in, uh, I think it's innate within the human spirit to know that the right kind of love is a transforming love. Yeah. You almost anticipate when you're a teenager finding that person who, because of their love, is going to help you be the right kind of person. Yeah. And the truth is that it's almost a myth that we expect to find someone who, because of their love, is going to transform us. Right. And we keep looking for that right person. Right. But the truth is there is someone who can do that, who, because of their love, can transform our, our whole life, bring us into a resurrected life, you might even say, a new beginning, a new life in Christ. Amen. And so that person who can bring a transforming love into our life is the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Yeah. No so doubt about it. Uh, once you experience that kind of love, it is a transforming love. It's a motivational love that makes you want to serve uh, God for his glory and to be involved in building the kingdom of uh, God. Amen. And so that is absolutely the uh, primary motivation for any kind of ministry. That's right. You bet. So, um, once, once our lives have been transformed by God's love, there is a new pers uh, worldview, a new perspective on the way we even view the whole creation and our role in it. And it affects the way that we interact in ministry towards other people. Yeah. It changes the way we uh, see them in a more, uh, from God's point of view. No doubt. So describe that. Yeah, well, you know, there's so many different instances in scripture, but we see people, we want to see people like Christ sees people. And, and how does Christ see people? Uh, it says he doesn't see them according to the flesh. He doesn't see us. He doesn't see mankind uh, according to the flesh. He sees them after their potential, after, after who they can be. And, and, and so anyway, and that's how, that's how the Lord sees us. And, um, 
And so anyway, when we get that perspective that, uh, you know, Jesus saw people, he saw them in their toughest, roughest situations. You know, you think about the, without going into too much detail here, but I mean, you think about, he was, saw his people oppressed by the Romans, oppressed by the government, and he saw the condition and he saw the state uh, of, of where they were in life. And, and, uh, and anyway, and he saw that they were like sheep without a shepherd. And so that's, that's what we do as ministers. We see people, we see the condition that they're in. We don't make prejudgments upon them, but we see people for the value that they have to God. And, uh, and, yeah. and really, so that's, uh, it should be value to the church too, regardless of their condition, we see their value. And this is so important for your involvement in any kind of ministry, but especially the chaplaincy. When you walk into a church environment, you see people and sometimes you view them as though they're co um, fam they're equal family members in the family of God. And you see people as having shared doctrine, shared faith experiences, shared eternal um, expectations, uh, the same hope. They've already found peace with God. If they're in church, you know, you kind of view them that way as part of the family. But when you walk into a work environment right. or a secular environment and you see people and you see super successful people and uh, super um, motivated, like maybe physically they're super fit or they're uh, very careful with their money and they're, they're um, always glitzed out uh, as far as the way they dress. And uh, maybe they even have a, a not a superior attitude, but just kind of a, a lofty uh, demeanor where they're very refined and very professional. And yet at the same time, when we look at them, we see them from God's point of view. These are people that need to know Christ. Amen. These are people with spiritual needs. Amen. They have spiritual needs just like you and me. And they need you as a chaplain to be able to um, walk them through uh, discovering that they have spiritual needs because they'll feel so um, um, independent. They'll feel so independent of God and they'll think they're okay. And then you can help them right. uh, discover uh, the joy of having a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, that's what we want to do as ministers, you know, as chaplains, that's what we want to do. We want to show people Christ. We want to, uh, we want to display Christ. We want to reflect Christ. Um, and, and so anyway, we want to, and to reflect him, we've got to see people like he saw people. And, and that's after their potential, after that relationship. That's what God wants. He's wanting that close, intimate relationship. So speaking of bringing people into relationship with God, what is uh, the ministry of reconciliation from a chaplain's point of view? What are they trying to accomplish? Well, they... As the scripture says, I mean, we've been given this ministry of reconciliation. Uh, we've been given this message of reconciliation. So it's important that those truths as the minister, the chaplain has these truths established in their heart about God's heart for people. And, you know, that scripture says, you know, so what do we do? We pray in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. And that's how we're, that's what, that's our ministry. That's what we're doing as a chaplain, as a minister. We, we are we are, we are imploring people, be reconciled to God. And the part of that be reconciled to God is to make sure they understand and feel that sense of peace that, uh, that comes from this message of reconciliation. When you say God's already re reconciled himself to you or to mankind, um, when, you, when someone thinks about that, there's a sense of peace that can come over an individual. And, and, you know, so much what we say about a chaplain, the role of a chaplain, uh, we say it, you see it on our website, you'll see it on our business cards, but we're bringing God's presence of peace right into secular organizations. And that's what we hope to do every time we minister, every time we go in on a chaplaincy appointment. That's what we're wanting to do. We're wanting to bring God's presence of peace right into that right. situation. So many people live independent of God. Right. And in that work environment, it's shocking to meet a chaplain. They may not have ever met a minister. Right. And to all of a sudden have in their secular space, somebody bearing the image of God, <laughs> the glory of Christ, and uh, um, having a joy of the Lord about them. 
Amen. What a great thing. What an amazing <laughs> opportunity. I'm I mean, telling really, you, this, what is, this is what excites me about yeah. this whole, uh, this whole thing of, of, you know, visiting chaplains is this being able to bring that right into that, that work environment, right into that hospital room, right into that resident facility, whatever it is. That's just so, so many exciting. ministers get stuck in their office. And this gets people who have been trained with the Bible and have a passion for ministry right into the space where people are. Amen. It's a, it's a great opportunity. Hallelujah. All right. So if we're <laughs> going to be doing this, if we're not just going to be thinking about it or studying, you know, kind of uh, constantly reading the Bible for ourselves and storing up all this knowledge and um, information about God and his will for us. Right. We're actually going to take it now and we're going to bring it into the secular space to meet uh the needs the spiritual needs of others right we're going to be doers doers of, of, of the calling right. that god has given to us so talk about that yeah so for sure i mean it's you know that that whole passage i've you know i did this lesson on was right from second corinthians chapter five but if you look at verse six i'm sorry chapter six verse one in second corinthians it says don't you know, don't receive this this gift, this message of reconciliation, this ministry of reconciliation, this ambassadorship, uh, this righteousness from God. Don't receive all this in vain. Hmm. You know, and I mean, to not read that verse in conjunction with chapter five would you're missing part of the picture because it says today's the day of salvation. You know, don't receive this gift of God in vain because today's the day of salvation, you know, not just for you, but for somebody else. And, and Paul's speaking to ministers there. He's speaking to people. He's speaking to people who are, he's speaking to the church and he says, don't receive, don't receive this gift of God in vain. No, we've got a, we've got a job to do. We've got, you know, when we receive this, it's now our responsibility to, to pass this word on. And, you know, the, the, Jesus's brother, James writes, and he says, Hey, um, if you're not a doer, if you're a hearer only, then, then, uh, uh, he basically says, you're looking in a mirror and you turn away from the mirror and you've forgotten who you were. You forgot what you look like. And, and so it's so important that we are not just hearers of the word only, uh, but doers of the word. Mm. So, um, so I just, super, when, yeah. When were you called into ministry? Is that an event in your memory or is that just um, something that you've kind of known in your gut? You know, some, I, about 20 years ago, I was at a meeting and I just, um, there was an experience with God and I just, I, I didn't know what it would look like. I didn't know it mm. would be a pastor. Yeah. Surely at 20 years ago, I didn't even consider a, being a Bible college director or anything like that. I had no clue what it looked like, yeah. but I knew that what was deposited in me, that, I knew that I wanted to share it and I knew that that love of Christ that had consumed my, the cab of my pickup truck that day, mm. I knew that I needed to tell people that experience or I wanted them to mm. be able to have an experience like that. So, man, it, I felt that responsibility, mm -hmm. you know, so anyway. When I was 11, I knew God called me to prepare for ministry, but like you, I had no idea what <laughs> that would look like. Right. And so, in the course of my uh, trying to be a doer yeah. of this ministry uh, that God's called me into, um, I've done a lot of different things, been involved in a lot of different ministries. And uh, being a part of the chaplaincy and trying to add that in to God's plan for my life in fulfilling his call to be a doer of the ministry of reconciliation. Yeah. Very exciting. Very exciting. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, you bet. Yeah. All right. So that pretty much wraps up the first lesson. Okay. Awesome. All so right. let's move on to the second. Get up. So uh, going into lesson two here, we're talking about chaplaincy in America. And so Tony, what's the uh, definition of a chaplain? Well, the definition of a chaplain is hotly contested in, a, in American uh, circles. A lot of people want to own that title and that word. And there are some people who define it in a very snooty way. In other words, if you don't have uh, the right education, three years of seminary, uh, 1,600 hours of CPE training, and then enter into an endorsement relationship, 
and then employment, then you're not a chaplain. And there are others, um, and really the majority, who define a chaplain as someone who simply has um, knowledge of the Word of God and has been endorsed by an endorsing agency for chaplaincy and is uh, willing to walk out of the church into the world into secular spaces and bring the presence of God uh, to those who have spiritual needs and they don't even know it. And so bringing the presence of God into a secular organization to meet spiritual needs, that's the definition of a chaplain that we're going with. Awesome. Good stuff. So um, next thing, what about uh, some of the history? What's, what's the history of chaplaincy here in America? I hope you enjoyed lesson two, <laughs> really. It was so exciting to put that together because there was a discovery for me on the history of chaplaincy in America as a uniquely American experience with the office of a chaplain, not in the life of the church, but in the life of our nation. The story about George Washington, when he was a 26 year old in 1756, writing to his superiors that the want of a chaplain, that the regiment feels it, and that they don't want someone to come and volunteer. And they don't, even though they are willing, they don't really want to pay for a chaplain on their own as a regiment, even though all the men were willing. What they wanted was the appropriate use of tax dollars to pay for a chaplain, just as they sent doctors and lawyers into the military to serve the uh, soldiers. George Washington wanted uh, chaplains uh, in the service in America as a 26 year old in, 17, in the 1750s. And he has numbers, a large number of uh, correspondence that he wrote on this topic. Then, okay, yeah, that, was, I love uh, it, man. that was the history. That was kind of like the, the <laughs> grassroots history of it. I love it, man. And then a year before our country declared independence in 1776, in 1775, and I'm just going to glance down so I don't say the wrong number, on July 29th in 1775, um, our Continental Congress approved chaplains for $20 a month. And then we brought chaplains in, okay, to American culture within the um, government uh, service, specifically the army, but other spaces too, um, for 20 bucks a month for a year. And then when we declared independence in uh, July 4th, 1776, uh, they wrote the constitution and they declared independence but they hadn't made a public display of the document. In uh, July 9th, uh, five, uh, four, uh, three days, <laughs> sorry, quick math in my head, July 4th to July 9th, so that's five days later, mm -hmm. they went out into the streets of Philadelphia and they rang the Liberty Bell, literally rang the bell, got a big crowd, and they read the Constitution. On that day, they went back into Congress, uh, this newly formed government, and they um, made the uh, chaplaincy a uh, fixed part of our nation's Congress, and they approved for 30 bucks a month, the um, or 33 dollars I think. The yes, yeah, 33 dollars a month for chaplains to be um, provided to the regiments in America. <clears throat> so that was uh, exciting times, right? Now the birthday of the chaplaincy in America was July 29th of 1775. That's a year before our country was uh, declared independence. But it officially um, was part of our nation's laws as a country, as a newly formed country, on July 9th of 1776. And then the other date that you really need to remember was that on September 25th of 1789, um, it became a uh, con congressional law. Now, it was a precedent that they were hiring chaplains um, back in 1775 and in 1776. But in uh, 1789, it became the law of Congress that we should be using tax dollars to hire chaplains. 
So that's, that's, um, it's a great yeah. sense. Since our nation was founded, we have hired chaplains to show up in Congress at 9 a.m. every day to open up in prayer. That has been since our nation's founding. Pretty cool stuff. It is awesome. And so <laughs> the use of the term chaplain and the whole idea of the office of a chaplain and using tax dollars, secular money, to bring somebody who can represent the presence of God into a secular space to meet spiritual needs has been a part of our fabric and our identity as Americans since our very beginning. It's very, under, and very important you understand that as people look at you and say, a chaplain? We're going to use our money to hire a chaplain? Really? And you say, of course we are, because in America, there's a rich history of doing so. Amen. Yeah. Well, that's good stuff. So, hey, Tony, what about legal issues? What about, uh, what's some of the legal uh, issues that we deal with with regards to chaplaincy? Well, there's been three primary legal challenges. We went through this in the lesson in detail. I'm just going to remind you that when people ask you, um, haven't there been legal challenges to the chaplaincy? You just want to be able to say, yeah, of, of course there have. And uh, 1983, 1986 were the two primary ones. And in both cases, it, they ruled in favor of the chaplaincy, even in the Supreme Court. And um, it just makes sense that the people who wrote the Bill of Rights and even uh, formed the separation between um, state and church are the same people who argued and wrote the language for the hiring of chaplains. And that was one of the court's um, conclusions and logic and making the argument that they should rule in favor of keeping the chaplaincy. Very good. Awesome. So, um, so what are some of the responsibilities? Um, what, you know, the roles and responsibilities of, of the chaplaincy? So this is going into lesson uh, three, mm -hmm. our third lesson, and uh, talking about the responsibilities of, of chaplains and not necessarily defining their duties, but mm -hmm. who are they responsible to? Right. Okay, so if you become a chaplain, you're responsible to the people who hired you, right? Because you're taking the presence of God into a secular organization, which means there's a person paying you money. Right. They're a boss. They're your employer. They're going to have expectations, and you're responsible to them. So whether it's issues of showing up on time, uh, dress code, um, all sorts of normal employment expectations. Right. At the same time, you're responsible to your endorsing agency. So there's somebody who has um, a whole bunch of policies and procedures and requirements and qualifications that is um, accredited to be giving endorsement to somebody who's jumped through all the hoops and finished all the work to become a chaplain. That's called an endorsing agency. And the endorsing agency that we're recommending with uh, visiting chaplains is National Service Charity because they've partnered with us to put this program together. And so you're responsible to your employer and you're responsible to National Service Charity or your endorser. Very good. Tony, I know early on uh, in some of our discussions, I always thought it was very interesting. Um, but mm -hmm. in talking about this dual role you talked about, how the chaplain in the military uh, situation, how they were there and they served, um, they served the, 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 I guess the officer over that, uh, mm. over that group, but he also, right. can, you, can you just yeah. say, give that example? Right. So I, I served as an army chaplain and in that environment, you're serving the mission of the battalion commander. I was a battalion chaplain. I wasn't, um, I didn't, you know, gain a significant leadership role in the army. I wasn't there long enough, but as a battalion uh, chaplain, you're serving the mission of the battalion uh, commander. And his mission is to have ready soldiers to perform the duties, uh, the, the mission of, of the army. And so whatever that mission is, uh, making sure the chaplains are ready to perform. So as a minister with the goal to bring people into re reconciliation between them and God, that's your ministry, that's what you're called to do. Right. At the same time, you're serving, you're being paid by somebody with secular money. 
And so they have an agenda that is not kingdom oriented. And so they have their own um, corporate mission and you are serving that corporate mission as a chaplain alongside serving the kingdom of God in relationship with people, making sure that you're meeting spiritual needs and bringing them along spiritually um, as a Christian chaplain uh, towards a relationship uh, with their God, with, Amen. with uh, Christ. Amen. Yeah. Good stuff. Right. All right. So, uh, well, thank you. I, I, I always love that. Um, I, right. I just love it. So anyway. Yeah, there's a duality that's very interesting. You don't have that duality in a church environment. Right. Right. In the church, it's all about the kingdom. Right. Right. But in a secular organization, as a chaplain, your uh, duties are 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 uh, twofold. Yeah. You have a duality. You are serving uh, God, mm -hmm. and you're serving um, um, God's kingdom agenda, and you're doing that in a secular organization that has their own their own uh, issues, their own right. uh, things they're they're trying to accomplish. Right. Yeah. So you bet. Fascinating stuff. You bet. All right. Uh, so, what are some of the things we can do, uh, can't do, shouldn't do? Um, right. Yeah. So, professionally, as a chaplain, um, it is it is important that a that a chaplain understands what they uh, what the scope of their service is, and that's another great way to put that is you have a scope of service as a chaplain that is focused on the things we just talked about. At the same time, there's things you can't do. Right. So, for instance, if you're in a um, company and you're showing up and you're providing uh, spiritual leadership, the presence of God, meaning spiritual needs, okay, and someone asks you to per, to um, to uh, provide professional counseling once a week for an hour, maybe in um, an office in the building where your work, where the company is, and they ask if you can provide one hour a week professional counseling. You can do that if you are a licensed counselor right. with appropriate insurance. Yeah, exactly. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> For real. Yeah. yeah. If, yeah. if you're a lawyer and, you're, um, and, and, and you have the, the right to act as a lawyer, then as a chaplain, you can provide counseling related to legal things. Right. But if, if you're a chaplain and you don't have these, these other certifications, then just work within the space where you're currently certified which your endorser is going to certify you to work as a chaplain, bringing the presence of God into a secular organization to meet spiritual needs. Right. Yeah. yeah. So that's your, that's, that's, that's your space. Yeah. And if you've gone to college and you've increased the space of your um, ability based on certifications, then do those things too, or offer it, but only do the things that, that you're, that you're qualified to do. This is a very important conversation um, for uh, chaplains. It is. It is. Yeah, yeah. really for all men. I worked at a prayer line on a from a Did television you? show years ago, um, and they would only they kept us five minutes yeah. on the phone call because they didn't want us counseling, and uh, they didn't want right. us counseling folks, and so they wanted us to meet their needs, pray for them, um, you know, but they didn't want us to. They didn't want us to have an abundance of time, and that anyway. And, yeah, and no part doubt. of that was so that uh, we wouldn't get into a situation where we're counseling people. So, my brother sells insurance, and he sells professional insurance called ENO, ENO insurance, professional insurance for like counselors, and that's a fantastic um, career path. And if you have an interest in that, then get the degrees and get the certification, right. and get the insurance and do it. But as a chaplain, your role is not to provide um, counseling or tell people what you think they should do. Uh, your role is to point them to, to Christ. Amen. Good right. stuff. <laughs> I like it. Okay. All right. Okay. That, by the way, that also applies not just in the secular space, but that also applies in the life of the church. Yeah. Okay. A lot of, a lot of times people think that just, became, just because they're ordained, that they should have a voice in the life of the church um, where they attend, even though they're not employed there. Maybe they're just a layman, but they became ordained. And then they end up having conflict with the senior pastor because they're acting like the minister. Okay. 
Um, there's limitations to what you can do as a chaplain in the secular space. And there's also limitations in the life of the church. And I think in this lesson, lesson three, I mentioned that just because you're a chaplain doesn't mean you're ordained to do like um, weddings. Yeah. 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 A wedding is managed by who? Well, generally in a church and by the pastor of the church. Yeah. But there's laws in our, yeah. Oh, in yeah. our government. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So ordained minister. Yeah. Marriage is, um, is a gift from God to humanity, to society. And I don't believe that marriage is a gift from God to the church. I believe it's bigger than that. I think God gave marriage to all of humanity. And so even though it, usually weddings happen in a church, if you're a Christian, um, at the same time, marriage is governed by the laws of the country in which you live, which means if you get married and you want to get unmarried, you have to go to the government to figure out what their laws are. That's right. Okay. It's a legal thing. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, just because you're a chaplain doesn't mean you can do weddings. Yeah. And it's just, okay. you know, it varies by state, you know, so if you're wanting to do a wedding or, mm -hmm. but you know, you need to check your state laws because uh, the laws in Michigan might be different than they are, are in Florida. So you need to make sure that you know um, the legal responsibilities uh, for, for marriage, uh, for marrying folks. So. Absolutely. Just yeah. remember your scope of service as a chaplain is one thing. Presence of God yeah. in a secular organization to meet spiritual needs. That's, right. That's what you're being credentialed to do by your endorser after going through this course. That's correct. Yeah. So can you do baptisms? Well... That's a great question, Tony. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so you're being endorsed by a national service charity or another organization uh, for it to be a chaplain. You're also being endorsed by your religious affiliation. Somebody in the denomination in which you operate or the church, at least where you mm -hmm. attend, somebody is going to have to give a, a faith-based letter of recommendation. That's right. Okay. When they do that, they're basically saying, this person represents our faith distinctives. Right. And they can rightly reflect us in this secular environment. Right. This person rep understands our doctrines, understands our faith traditions, and they can rightly represent us in, ex and, uh, in, in the presence of God from our point of view as, as a church. Right. That church has their own traditions about who can baptize people. Or who can do um, the Lord's Supper? Yeah. So I'm not saying you can or can't. I'm saying you need to check with your faith uh, tradition within your own faith tradition and the people who are uh, recommending you to be a chaplain from your faith background, and you need to live within the uh, um, traditions and the stand and the uh, expectations that they have for you. Right. So yeah, and I think that's you laid that out beautifully because. Like, uh, like Tony and I are great brothers in Christ, but we come from different backgrounds. And so from Tony's background, um, you know, they would have different requirements than maybe the background that I'm from with regards to our faith distinctives. And so I just think, uh, but I think Tony laid that out perfectly. And of okay. course, if you have any questions, you always would feel free to contact us and uh, let us know that you have a question about a certain situation. We'd definitely be there to support. Mm -hmm. Uh, questions like that so yeah. yeah we'd love to answer any questions you can um there's an email on the website for uh, tom or tony at visitingchaplains.com but you can also contact the endorsing agency that gave you chaplaincy status you can also check with the place where you worship and just ask them you know if someone at work wants me to baptize them is that okay and yep. they might say yes they might say no so you need to ask so it's good to know. Yeah, great. Right. Okay. Let's see here. Oh wow, this is a big one, folks. And this is um, this. Uh, so we'll, we'll get right into this. This is a big question here. But um, is it okay uh, for us to do an active a chaplain to do an active ministry uh, outside the chaplain's faith? So uh, it kind of parallels the last uh, last things we were just talking about there. But uh, 
what about these acts of ministry that are outside our faith distinctives, outside of our beliefs? So I'm actually going to turn this around and ask Tom the same question, but I'm going to define an act of ministry before I ask him the same question. Okay. Yeah. What's an act of ministry? An act of ministry is when you as a minister do something visible, okay, or some activity that connects that person and their relationship with God. Right. So maybe you're doing a prayer, maybe you're doing a baptism, maybe you're doing the Lord's Supper, maybe you're preaching like explaining something in the Bible, acts of ministry, explaining something in the Bible is a bad example, unless it's in a um, church environment where you're doing a sermon or something, that's an act of ministry. So an act of ministry from a Protestant point of view kind of has a short definition, but if you're from a Islamic background, your definition of an act of ministry is completely different. If you're in a Catholic background, there are seven acts of ministry specifically that the church identifies. And they call them the seven sacraments. So I'm going to ask Tom, if you're a chaplain and someone asks, asks you to visit their mom in the hospital and they're worried she's going to die today mm -hmm. and they want you to offer last rites and you're standing there and they ask you that, what do you do? Well, I cannot do that. Uh, I can't perform last rites, but what I can try and do is I can try and find a Catholic uh, priest, someone who can do last rites, um, since that is her background, um, and it's not my background, uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't do that, so I, need, I would need to provide, uh, I would need to get on the phone, uh, I would need to provide uh, someone for that situation, mm -hmm. because I couldn't do that, I couldn't perform last rites, mm -hmm. uh, because I don't it's not my faith distinctive. I don't understand that. I don't believe that. Um, so regardless of the historical uh, reasons why they do that, uh, it's not my faith distinctive. So I don't do it. Hmm. Uh, there's something really key that he said there. He said he can't perform it, but he can provide it. So, so I went to, um, um, what was the name of the, I went to, I went through Chobik. This is chaplain officer basic training and I did it up in a military base in New Jersey. I'm just going blank right now what the name of it is. Sorry. And <laughs> so one of the primary things that they drill in your head as a chaplain in the military, I mean, this is like the number one lesson as a chaplain that you have to know. You have to have it cold in your in your in your mind. I mean, no confusion, no fog, hundred percent clear on. You either perform or you provide spiritual care. Right. If you're performing it, it's because it's within your faith tradition. Right. If it's not something you can perform, then you provide an opportunity for somebody to get that spiritual care that their faith tradition um, is um, that that they're, that they're trying to receive within their within their faith. Right. So if um, let me just give you an extreme example. And this was not true in the military when I was there because there was hardly anybody there we could find that had a Wicca background. Oh boy. A Wicca background basically is old uh, European pagan religion where they worship in an open sky with running water and fire and earth and, and just whatever. So if someone asked me to provide that kind of space for them, yeah, I, I didn't have any desire to, perform or be involved in any of that. I wasn't going to open it up with prayer. I wasn't going to bless it. I wasn't going to be involved in any way, <laughs> but I would provide it. Okay. Cause they're an American soldier and uh, they have a right to religious ex expression. And provide means what? Provide means I'm going to um, secure on the calendar an opportunity right. for them to worship in the way that they requested. Right. I will not be involved in any way of their performing of it right. or the activity of it, right. but I will provide for them for their um, constitutional right for uh, freedom of religion and expression. Sure. And if that's what they ask for, I'll provide for that opportunity, right. but um, you won't see me there on stage doing anything to participate. Right. And so how that might work itself out in a corporate setting uh, mm -hmm. with visiting chaplains is that uh, there might be a, a, a Muslim 
uh, that's working at this facility where we are contracted and I can't perform um, any sacerdotal duties for this person. Right. Uh, um, but I would need to provide someone for this, uh, for this individual. So I would have to find uh, an imam or someone to come and service uh, the needs of this person because I couldn't do it. Or just on a simpler basis, if they ask to pray certain times during the day, yeah, then I would work with their um, immediate management to um, provide an opportunity for them to have that prayer time during the workspace. Uh, so that they can um, not be restricted in their uh, expression of their faith during the work hours, but to do it in such a way that it doesn't bring attention to them or embarrass them in any way. And so you would coordinate with uh, management uh, and their employer to see if there's a chance that they could express their faith in that way while at work uh, during the prayer times that are required of them. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's, that's, that's humane, guys. Yeah. That's just being humane. That's being human. That's being a part of um, the the society, the world in which you live. Yep. And it's not your doctrine, and it's not your faith, and it's not what you believe. Right. But you respect that other person's um, desire to re- worship in the way that um, they've grown up and that they understand. Right. And at the same time, you pray for them, and you Amen. look for opportunities to share the gospel with them. Amen. And that's the unique opportunity you'll have as a chaplain. Amen. Well, I love it. That's good. Mm-hmm.